So, yeah, women are quite powerful in India. So, um, not great. So, sorry for this delay, small technical glitches. So, very welcome, Simon. And, uh, well, the floor is yours already, so I'm extra here, so. Thank you, please. Okay, right, so you, who's, who's controlling the audio? Because that's quite loud. Um, you can probably turn me down a little bit, otherwise I... No, it is okay. It's okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so my name is Simon McCallum. I'm a New Zealander. Um, I've been teaching game development for um, about uh, 13 years. So I started teaching in 2004 in Otago University in New Zealand, um, which I say is the furthest you can go from Europe and still get a PhD, right? So you can't, if you want to escape your parents, it's absolutely the opposite side of the earth. We're not quite the opposite here in Portugal. We're kind of off the coast of Napier, right? So we're nearly directly opposite New Zealand right here. Um, I worked as a, I went through, I got my first computer when I was 10, and so I started programming because after buying all the games that existed for my ZX Spectrum, because there were like six of them, um, I ran out of things to play, so I had to make my own. Right? So from the age of 10, I started programming. Uh, so I've been programming for 32 years. I did my first commercial programming at the age of 16. I did the local invoicing system for my hut for the hardware store. So I did their invoicing and their stock take system, and I wrote that in the, in the database system when I was 16. So that's my first commercial job. Um, and I went through and did a computer science degree and did computer programming. So, um, with a bunch of psychology, um, my PhD was on the functional purpose of REM sleep. So, why humans dream, why cats dream, and building neural network models and associated memory, and then doing a dreamlike phase to make them better. Right? So, I've got a bunch of neuroscience, a bunch of games. Um, and I do other weird things like, um, oh, popped up there. Uh, I was uh, in Denmark this um, summer. Um, okay. Um, I was in Denmark this summer and I uh, built trebuchets. So I built siege engines from the 9th century Europe. Um, so I also know about medieval sea rendering. So I'm a, a big wide variety of things that I do. But today I'm going to be talking about games and gamification. Now, uh, and working with experts, because when you move beyond making games purely for entertainment and you start saying, well, games are really engaging, can we use that for something other than just fun? And there are lots of situations where people might cognitively want to do something, but not quite have enough motivation to do it. So if the problem is a motivation challenge, then games are quite good at that, right? So we can look at how we can use games to just get that, get you over the top, get you past a certain point. Um, and so, what is gamification? Um, now, you guys have all heard of gamification. Right? Um, I personally dislike a bunch of the definitions that are out there because they talk about using game mechanics in non-game spaces, and I don't think that's good enough, right? Um, because you can use gamification on games. Uh, you can think in a game-like way uh, in many situations, including game situations. Um, I, uh, the example I use of, of the, one of the earliest gamifications of, of games or sports is the Olympics. Right? The Olympics was a gamification, is the modern Olympics is a gamification of sports. The ancient Olympics was a gamification of training. Right? It was a game for training. So we've been doing this for thousands of years, right? This isn't a new fad. This is something humans have done to make what they want to do more entertaining, right? To actually give you purpose and motivation. Um, so using game mechanics in, um, to improve and engage and enhance user experience. So um, I gamify my education. Uh, I, I believe that gamif uh, that all education, right? So the education you get at primary school and, and high school are all <coughs> a gamification of something we love doing, which is learning. Right? Humans love learning. So, but the society decided we want you to learn these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and reward you for learning the things we think you should know. So we're going to gamify that by giving it grades. 
and we're going to have different status. So we're going to have primary schools and high schools and universities. And at university, we'll have different status universities. And within the university, we'll have bachelors and masters and PA. So it's all this kind of gamified infrastructure around learning. But learning itself is fun. You know, it's a fun activity. But by, by adding games, we've actually made a pretty bad game out of learning. Right? If, you, if you look at the game of education, um, it has long and slow feedback loops generally. Right? So when you look at standard education, if you study in August and you, or September and you do an exam in December and then you get the grades in January, you're studying in August, you get reward in January. That's a long time to wait for a reward cycle, right? That's, you have to be really <coughs> forward thinking to be able to kind of work out, oh yeah, I have to do something now? Way in the future, I'm going to get some small reward. Yeah? That's, that's a bad game. Um, we tend to also like suck the joy and the choice out of learning. Right? So games offer a bunch of choice. Right? They're one way of defining a game is a sequence of interesting choices. But if games rip, but if your game rips out all choice and you tell people what they want, they have to do then you've made a bad game, right? You've stripped all the choice out. And we don't give that much choice to high school students and to, to, to other students. So, so I think currently our game and our, our, our game of education is a bad game. And so I'm, I'm looking at ways of transforming my education and making it more game-like. Um, so I break gamification in kind of two layers. I talk about a surface layer. And these, these are what I call some of the simple game mechanics, which some of your first years hopefully will recognize. And if we look at game mechanics, you go balance, right? So balance is a standard game mechanic where we say you should have choices, and those choices should be somewhat balanced. Now, rock, paper, scissors, people identify the other two, which are? Lizard spot. spot, excellent. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors, the there's spot, there's geeky enough people in the room, so that's great. Um, so this is too balanced, right? Because each of the choices is equally powerful, right? So it's kind of almost overbalanced. But if I give you one clear strategy and I say, okay, we're gonna play rock, paper, scissors, there's a spot, but rock will beat everything except rock. Right, now play that game. And we go, okay, ready? One, two, three, rock. One, two, three, rock. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a game anymore. There's an obvious right strategy because there is no balance in your choices. Right? And so as a game mechanic, giving choice which has balance is one of the aspects we use. Um, games use currency. You earn and spend some commodity. It could be gold, it could be credits. Um, one of the things we looked at for my courses uh, is uh, which um, Unfortunately, in my game, the game programming degree that I teach in Norway, um, I don't need to motivate my students much because they're really keen to learn game programming. In fact, they're more keen to learn game programming than the other courses they're doing at the university, which means if I make my courses even more engaging, there's been even less time on their maths and their other algorithms and programming. So, strategically, I have to make my courses worse so my students will do the other things they're supposed to do. Right? From a meta game design, I have to nerf my courses because I can't buff the other courses because the lecturers there won't let me go in there and make their courses better. Um, and so I have to actually limit my students so they don't spend too much time on the fun stuff. One of the things we looked at with currency was if you get the top grade, if you get an A in one assignment, you get to carry some grade over into the next assignment. And you can then spend that grade in adjusting the weighting on the components <laughs> of the next assignment. So if I was going to weight the, the writing 30% and the, um, the output 30% and, and the discussion 30% and the formatting 10%, if you've got a high grade previously, you can spend some of that to adjust down the, the you know, maybe the output goes down to 20 and you put the writing up to 40 or you put the output up to 40 and the writing up to 20 because you know you're not going to be very good at the writing. So you spend the credit you've earned by doing well on adjusting the grading for the next assignment. Right? 
So you get this idea of earning and spending currency. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one thing we do in games. Um, points are an interesting one because we as mostly males in, in the game development industry um, are very easily affected by points. Right? Um, men tend to not see through the fact that points are worthless on their own. Uh, a lot of the women in the, in the industry, a lot of women in the world, um, when they play games, they're not as interested in the points because they see the points as, as like, why? Whereas men tend to go, oh, points, yeah. Um, and so it's a very shallow motivation, but it works quite well for a while until people realize, well, they're just points, right? But you know, if you play the paperclip game or you play cookie um, clicker, numbers and numbers growing and getting bigger is really engaging. Um, psychology, reward structures. Um, we think about and we use this idea that, that small, small rewards with irregular large rewards is a really good way of hooking people. Right? So, so having some randomness is strategically from a Skinner box point of view an, a very easy way to try and hook human beings. And it's very shallow, it's not kind of deep and engaging and fun, that's how gambling works, but it is a mechanic we use in games quite a bit. Um, and status. <coughs> we, as humans, tend to, like, different cultures use this in different ways, but, but having a status being made a higher rank or trying to achieve and be recognized by the other people in our, in, in our friendship group, um, that matters to us. Right? And so this idea of, of giving status. Now, of course, universities do this with PhDs and professors and, and undergraduates and graduate students and postgraduate students, blah, blah, blah. blah right? So they all of these status issues. Uh, and depending on which culture you're in, um, Turkish culture, for example, is very heavily status. Norway, not so much. New Zealand, very little status. We're a very flat country. So we don't care that much about status. But we still use it in games. These are all tools, right? They're, mecha they're mechanics, so you can make things out of them. They're a bit like you know, concrete and steel and, f and marble and glass. And so there are they're materials that you can use. You can either make an amazing concrete building or a horrifying concrete building. Right? They're all, in fact, this building, far more technically advanced than the Colosseum. Right? Because you know, this has hot and cold running water and steel reinforcement. Colosseum didn't have steel reinforcing. Right? So, you know, this is a terrible building and this is a fantastic building. Not really, right? I mean, technologically, these are, it's not the technology that we care about. It's the design, it's the look, it's the, the cultural aspects, it's the other aspects that make it engaging. And so if we want to look at sort of deep engagement and we want to work with professionals who are trying to change people's attitudes, we have to go beyond just the sort of points, badges, and leaderboards, the PBL. Um, and I sometimes describe this as being the, the wrong focus. And you might have heard of chocolate uh, properly, but if you've got Brussels sprouts and you think Kit Kats are quite, an, like, quite popular, then, and in Norway they're called quick lunch, right? Because the Norwegians stole them about two years after they were first created, but then, They've won the battle on keeping their own brand. So, so they have a quick lunch and they buy a lot. Um, so if I made a kind of Kit Kat sprout version and I said, well, chocolate wrapped around biscuit center and put in a shiny wrapper sells really well. So what if I just take Brussels sprouts and I wrap, wrap them around the biscuit center and put them in a shiny packet and sell those? And are you gonna buy Kit Kat sprouts? <laughs> um, well, the Japanese and the Koreans have actually got green Kit Kats. Um, they have green tea Kit Kats. They have thousands of varieties of really strange flavors of Kit Kats. But these ones are green tea in white chocolate. That is still chocolate because the chocolate's an integral part. It's not something you can just rip apart, look at the individual bits, and work out, oh, if I get this bit, it'll be good, and that bit will be good. I don't need the rest. If you did that to chocolate, you would get some milk, <laughs> taste it, go, eh, that's okay. Get some sugar, oh yeah, that tastes right. Get some raw cocoa beans, you go, oh, ugh, that's awful. 
Okay, so the good bit of chocolate is the sugar. Okay, we'll just use sugar. So, but that's not chocolate. <laughs> it's just sugar. You've kind of not got it right anymore, right? So, a game is more than just its constituent parts. You've got to put them together. So, what we do is we, it's about understanding human beings. That's a gamification, serious game. To good game design is all about understanding human beings. And if you want to look at how you change people, you've got to look at how people work. Uh, and so you've got to think about motivation, you've got to think about fatigue, you've got to think about social aspects, emotional aspects. Novelty is a big one. People will start to pick up a game and play it for a while, and then it will disappear. So Pokemon Go seemed to have quite a strong novelty effect. And there's not as many Pokemon Go players around as there were a year ago. Did you, have you noticed that? <laughs> were there a lot? Yes, there were a lot of Pokemon Go players, and there are still some, but not many. Right? So, so this kind of these psychological effects that on on people are very important to understanding what you're doing. Um, and so, when we look at serious games, when we're trying to understand people, we're trying to understand how to change behaviour. Right? Because if you're trying to run more or eat better or change people's attitudes about City Cop project, that part of the reason why I'm here in Portugal, we're trying to change children's attitudes about the police. Right? So we're trying to make a game which is going to change their attitudes to how they interact with the police by showing them what the police do by making them play a game where they get to be the police. Right? And they get to do community policing, proximity policing, as it is in Portugal. Um, and so by trying to, to show them what something is and, and motivating them to engage in that environment, we kind of change their opinions. And so we look at what things change your opinions, right? and what change things motivate people. And by doing that, one of the ones that we use quite a lot is self-determination theory. Have any of you use self-determination theory? Do you know what it is? You've heard of it? You've used it? Yep. Um, and so we also strongly believe that one size doesn't fit all. Right? So, um, there is no one best flavor. So you might like gelato, you might like ice cream. But is okay, so who thinks chocolate ice cream is the best ice cream? And strawberry flavored ice cream? Three? So we've got about four for chocolate, for three or four for chocolate, three or four for strawberry. Right? So is there one obviously best ice cream flavor? Right? No, it's it's opinion, right? So are you gonna make one game? that is both chocolate flavoured and strawberry flavoured and appeal to everybody because it's everybody's favourite flavour, right? It's kind of, well, probably not. So it doesn't have to be games that work for everybody. It has to be games that work for some people, right? So when you're trying to engage people, you don't say, I'm just going to engage everybody. You might have to say, okay, I want to engage people like this who are, who are doing this activity and want to behave like this, right? It won't, won't be for everyone, it will be for a lot of people. And then you say, okay, well, what kind of players are out there? And then you can start thinking about basketball player types. If you've seen this before, the idea that there are different player types. And so you've got killers, achievers, socializers. This was for text-based MMOs. And so it was only a first approximation. And he said, well, actually, um, there's killers, socializers, and, and down there, some explorers down at the bottom there. Um, these are only some of the types, right? And so if you have a look, um, you, he adds another layer of it, makes it a three-dimensional box, and then he wasn't even satisfied with that, so he's added another set of categories beyond this to get up to 12 categories. Um, so he keeps building this and saying, well, actually, in other games, there are more types of people. But the idea here is that we're not all the same. We're not all motivated by the same thing. But we do have some similarities. Uh, and if you look at kind of a, a couple of those. You can look at this list of other categorization of player types, right? So Bartle's not the only one. Um, you have um, Kellos has Elix, Aegon, Nemesis, and Elian as different approaches to different player types, right? So don't just pick one system. You can actually look at various systems which all kind of have similarities, right? These are all a bit similar about kind of power and interacting and, and acting on things, right? So, so the fact that other people find similar features suggests that they might be underlying features. 
So, what we look at is what makes games engaging. So, in self determination theory, and I, I believe this quite strongly, part of the reason why games are engaging is that they give you choices, they give you agency. Right? You are in control. It's not, and, and that your, your choices matter. You are the agent that is making things happen. Um, if you're not, if you're just reading a story, that's a book. Books can be engaging, very engaging by their narrative, but that's not a game, right? Games are engaging because you're interacting, because you are making choices. So agency, autonomy, control. Challenge feedback. Games are quite good at when you do something that is hard, they reward you, right? Because if I just reward you for, oh look, you tied your shoes. Well done, you! Yay! That's kind of well. You should be able to tie your shoes. You're kind of old enough now. <laughs> if someone kept like praising you for how amazing you were to get your shirt on and put your trousers on and do your shoes up, and, and it gets old, right? It's kind of well. It means nothing because I. It wasn't hard. I didn't struggle. It wasn't something I kind of was passionate about <coughs> that I finally achieved. It was just I am. It's just every day. So this kind of, of confidence building, when you do something difficult, you get told you've done well. Games have crafting, so games like making things. Right? So there's this, this there are, and some games have more crafting than others, but generally it's quite nice in games to be able to have some sort of customization, something you can create. Right? So Minecraft is the obvious example of doing this. Um, experimentation. Curiosity, games allow you to do things you wouldn't normally be allowed to do or able to do. Um, so I was working with a public health group in New Zealand um, and they wanted to teach teenage mothers about child safety. Right? Because teenage mothers have already dropped out of school and they don't go to the seminars and read pamphlets. So they wanted to make a game. Um, and we were working with a game company, and I was consulting, and we got up to where the baby would grab a knife from, a, uh, from the shelf. And the nurses wanted the game to fade to black. As soon as the baby got hold of the knife, the, the game would fade to black, and you'd reset. And we as gamers were doing the, no, no, the baby has to grab the knife and stick it in their head. Because <laughs> you have to see the consequence of your action. Right? And it's okay to show babies with knives in their head, because these people are gamers, right? They're teenage mum. They've already stepped outside of the, oh, we don't really want to see scary stuff, because they're having a baby at 16, right? Um, they're not squeamish. Um, and so it's trying to convince these middle-aged women who were health nurses that it's okay to show babies with like knives in their heads and boiling water pouring over and the skin coming off. And you've got to show those consequences. Because the game will not teach the mothers to care, right? Games won't change them in the sense of, oh, now I care about my baby. Right? That's not what games are good at. One of the things they're good at is showing you what happens without your baby actually getting hurt, right? And so you can't just fade to black and say, no, no, just do what we tell you or else. Or else what? That's not going to work. So you had to, to allow them to experiment. You had to, and in fact, you know, you had to let some of the girls see how badly they could injure their baby. Right? That doesn't mean they're going to injure their baby in real life, right? Because they actually care about their baby, right? But it means they understand consequences, and they were and they were learning sort of perceptual learning. So, so those sort of things the games are good at. But you have to understand that you, you're not telling people how to behave. You are showing them the consequences of what happens when they do actions. Um, and I was told for about 10 years of my life, from about the age of 10 to about the age of 20, that games were anti-social. Right? The games weren't a social activity. And this was, you know, the 80s and the 90s where games had a bad reputation. Um, but for me, they were always social because I talked to all my friends about games all the time. I was very social when I, I played games with people. It was a social activity. I just didn't do the social things with the rest of society. Right? So I wasn't talking about rugby, and I wasn't talking about 
cricket and football, and I wasn't talking about, you know, television shows and, and other people's culture. I was talking about games. So I was social in my own social group. And so games have always been social. And finally, with Facebook, we've recognized that, you know, there are some massively social games out there. Uh, and Pokemon Go explicitly is a serious game. Um, Google in Niantic um, intentionally designed it to try and get people out and talking with each other and in the same environment without direct confrontation, which is why they didn't have any PvP battles. Right? So it was actually explicitly designed as a social game. Um, now, as a game designer, all of those rules are great, and games are fantastic at motivating people, and doing, getting people to do things, but you also have to worry about the negative consequences of what you do when you play with people's motivation. Right? What is the consequences of getting it wrong? Um, and so when we were doing City Cop, um, one of the things we were terrified of, basically, was um, if we gamify the, the engagement with police, if we give you guys points for the number of police reports you file, that's going to be terrible, right? Because you're going to fill out lots of police reports, and police won't be able to do anything at all. If we gave you points for not filing police reports, then that would also incentivize you to, if I've got a problem, I won't tell the police, I'll just deal with it myself, and I won't interact with them, right? So, so it was kind of, how do you make it engaging to engage with the police at the right kind of way. And so that got really complex. And in fact, we pretty much gave up on that particular aspect. We couldn't find a good way of gamifying an engagement app with the police without it just going silly, okay? Um, because when you engage with the police, you're already kind of motivated because something's gone wrong. Um, and we don't really need to add more to that, right? So, so if you look at the, the dangers that you have, extrinsic rewards. When I reward you for doing something, you might change from having a desire to do it to doing it for the reward. Um, so there has been a few gamifications, a few experiments on this. Um, in America, they did some with, with kids and drawing. So they went into a primary school, into a kid's school, and they paid the kids for every drawing. So you give them $1, for every drawing they do. And then you do that for a few weeks, right? There's a few sessions a week for several weeks. Uh, and you record how much the kids draw, and you have a control group, and you have the experimental group, and you're paying them to draw. Um, and then, you know, you see uh, at the end, you stop paying, and you see what happens. Now, the group who you were paying money to increased the amount they drew, but decreased the complexity. Right? So basically they worked out what was the minimum drawing they could do to hand to you to get money. Right? So they kind of optimized their drawing performance. And they drew a lot to try and get more money. Um, when you stopped, the students who had been paid to draw dropped the amount they drew. So, so they, crawled, they paid them, they went up. And then when you stopped paying them, they crashed down and went far below <laughs> the people who you'd never incentivized. Right? Uh, and that's because they had changed why they drew. They changed it from I draw, I draw because I love drawing to I draw for money. And if you don't pay me, I'm not going to draw. So if you make a game of something, when the game ends, what happens to the players? Do the players lose all their intrinsic motivation? Uh, and how long have you broken them for? Right? Does this, does this mean it's a, just a very short dip and they come back up, or is it a long duration? Uh, and for some of this, it can be quite a long duration. If you tinker with people's motivation, you might break them long term. Um, so there was a, another example in, in Israel where um, they had a kindergarten um, uh, for, for small children. Uh, and they had about 10% of parents who were picking up their kids late. So they thought, okay, what we'll do is we'll have a fine. Right? We'll make them pay 20 bucks if they turn up late to pick up their kids. And so they thought, well, you know, if we find them, then you know, they'll be more motivated and incentivized to turn up. And it went from 10% to 20% of people picking up their kids late. Because now you're in a meeting and you think, oh, 
I'm going to be late. Eh, it's only 20 bucks. I'll stay in my meeting. Right? So there are some people who saw it now as a financial transaction. They would just pay the extra 20 bucks because it was only 20 bucks. Right? Only 20 euro, and you know they get to stay an extra half hour at their meeting and, and get things sorted. Um, and so the, the kindergartner goes, oh no, oh no, that's wrong, we don't want to do that. Okay, okay, well no, no, go back to the way we were, right? We'll take away the fee and you guys will come and pick up your kids on time. So what happened? <laughs> it went up to 30, 35% because now it was a service that you offered for free. <laughs> so you changed the social agreement about picking your up kids up on time, you turned it into a financial transaction, and then you discounted it. Right? And so they had broken the agreement, they'd broken that social contract by extrinsic motivators, by a fine. And then they couldn't get it back, because once you get transitioned, it's over. Right? Um, and what seemingly might be a good thing could destroy an experience. When we gamify things, we have to worry about the consequences. What are the consequences of what you're doing? What will, when people are gaming and they saw this Pokemon Go, once you're on your phone, you're gaming on your phone and you walk into the street and get hit by a car because you're no longer paying attention because your focus is on the game, not on your world. So if we are dragging people's attention, if we are motivating them to do things, <coughs> what happens when they overdo that? What happens when they they're over-focused. Um, and you know, if we make too many things into a game, everything's a game, then you kind of get bored of games because everything's a game, and it's kind of, oh god, another game. And, like, why can't we just do something simple and something easy? I just want to watch TV. I don't want to have to be something I have to kind of solve a puzzle to get another 10 minutes of television, right? Ah, uh, I just, you know, I'm tired of choices. Um, this was one of the problems we had at CityCop, was alienation. Um, a lot of our police officers and lawyers in our consortium weren't gamers. Right? And as soon as we mentioned making a game of something, they went, no, 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 we're police. We don't play games, we shoot people. Actually, no, they didn't say that. Um, but, you know, it was, you know, they did carry guns, so they could shoot people, actually, in real life. Um, and so you don't really need to make a game of shooting people because that's something they have to do. Um, so no, it, it, because of what they, they, they take a status position, they don't want to erode their status. And so you have to be careful of, of when, when you make things kind of more you know, user choice and, 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 and fun and lighthearted and, and allow kind of uh, a discussion to go on then you break some of those status issues, right? And the police need status to make sure you do what they say, when they say, because there's often other risks involved that you might not know. So um, you can also make things too social or too competitive. And one of the things I've saw in gamification and it's still a problem is that there are a bunch of people who got into gamification from the business side of things. So they read a few books about gamification and think, oh, all right, I now understand gamification. If I just tick these boxes, I've gamified it. And that'll be enough. I don't need to understand games. I just need to tick some boxes and yay, I'm a gamification expert because I've read three books. Yay. Um, yeah. Uh, <sighs> consultants aren't designers. Consultants don't understand the emotional motivation of things. They're just sitting there ticking boxes and they really frustrate me, right? Because they've given gamification a terrible name, right? So if you go out there now and say, I'm doing gamification, they go, oh, you're one of them. And you go, no, no, I do the good version. And you go, no, no, you just, you know, you just take, you're, you're a marketer who's just got a new buzz term, right? And so, yeah, unfortunately, the whole serious game gamification area got kind of wiped out by consultants coming through and doing a really terrible job. Um, I see some thoughts. Um, and I, so, so you now get new terms coming up, so like playful design or engaging design or, or uh, motivational design instead of gamification to try and differentiate from the marketing buzzword from what we're doing. Um, now, so serious games. 
these are some of the serious games, and we've been, I've been involved in various parts of these, and we study these and analyze these. I have a master's course where we go through and teach about serious games. Uh, we mainly focus on education, where I have various PhD students, and master's students, and bachelor students doing, doing work in games for education. And we also have Games for Health. Um, I'm part of the Games for Health network, and I go to the Games for Health conference regularly. Uh, and we're hosting a P-Health conference with Game Tracks. So we have a bunch of projects, everything from dementia games, which we've done. We've worked with autism. Um, you can even look at, at uh, social games. Uh, a couple of the, the ones actually in here, which uh, I will have to, I have not think. Um, this one. So Sparks. Uh, is an Auckland game designer, um, so Mishia Interactive. Uh, she worked with Auckland University to create um, Sparks, which is a game for teenagers with depression. Uh, and what they were trying to do is that in New Zealand there's a limited number of psychologists to deal with teenage depression, and so you'd be diagnosed and you had about a four month waiting list, right, before you get to see a psychologist. <laughs> and there's one way of making people more depressed, and they say, you've got a problem, we can't talk to you for four months. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> it's kind of, huh, what do I do now? Like, now I know I'm depressed, we can't do anything. Um, and so what they found is that this game was as good as giving standard counselling, but far better than being on a waiting list. Right? If you actually gave people something to do, then that helped them because right? they felt like they were able to do something. Right? So, so as a game, it actually helped people with, with and teenagers who were depressed and potentially committing suicide. So, so I've worked in the games for health area. Um, we've also worked with games for social challenges. So we worked with the Youth Olympics, um, North, um, the Norwegian Epilepsy Foundation. We helped them run a, a 100,000 kroner competition. That's not euro, so about thousand euro. So it was an award to um, students for the best game related to, to understanding epilepsy. Right? So, so a prize based competition. Um, now why I'm here is actually uh, One City. Uh, and this is a game we've been working with the uh, Portuguese police, uh, the Romanian police, the Irish police, the Italian um, police, uh, and the German police. So we've got a whole bunch of European police forces and we've been looking at how we make a game to engage kids. Right? Now, the Portuguese police have been the most engaged of any of those police forces on this game. Right? So we're releasing the Portuguese version of this game in a couple of weeks. Uh, and basically, it's a SimCity style game with citizens, and we have scenarios which the police can set the numbers of things. Right? So they can set the numbers of police officers, the number of citizens, how often um, graffiti <laughs> happens, how quickly fear spreads through the community. So they control some of the parameters and they can set up scenarios which the, stu the games, the students play uh, on their mobiles. Right? So it's a, a mo mobile game where you can load in different scenarios in different cities. Right? Now one of the things we're hoping to do um, through the next few semesters, right? so well, until next semester, so through to June 18, is potentially engage some of you as students to look at working with the police and working with this style of SimCity game and actually use a real client, the, the um, Portuguese police, uh, and help them build and develop scenarios right? and have real life projects. And so one of the reasons I'm here is to try and get you engaged in this um, working with the police and building games for this. As you know, some of you might be interested in this kind of social change kind of game. Um, now, when you work with police and you work with experts, one of the things you have to do is understand their objectives and understand their expertise. And particularly, respect them for understanding their discipline. Right? As game designers and game developers, we tend to get kind of very focused on our mechanics and very focused on our games. Uh, and this particular situation requires us to design the scenarios with tunable parameters, a bit like a scripting engine, that allow the experts to understand what's happening in the game and then affect what happens in the game. So of all of these areas, 
the reason I'm here is actually this small working with these experts, working with education experts, working with health experts, in this case working with um, the police. So in a serious game, the game actually just sits in the middle here. The experts come in and they will provide context. So for this for the city cop game, what the police will do is they will go into schools. Right? So they have you know, school visits and they'll take the game with them and they'll talk the context of the game. So understanding that context means that when you go into the game, it's only part of an overall strategy. Right? So the game is just some small part where they might have reviews in here but you look at the review and the reflection afterwards with the teacher, and perhaps the community and proximity police officer, where they discuss the game with you. Right? They discuss what you did in the game, why you did it, uh, what the challenges were, and you know they, we have we have levels where you have lots of police officers, and so it's really easy to solve the problems because you just allocate resources really easily. And then later levels, you don't have enough police officers. And so it becomes harder and harder. And we're still discussing whether we have the Kobayashi My Room style, if there are enough geeks in the room, um, where you have scenarios you're going to lose, right? The city is going to fall apart, everything's going to be broken, and there's nothing you can do because you do not have enough police to solve all the problems, right? We're still not sure we should do that to kids, um, create scenarios that are impossible to win. But, um, the actual police uh, were interested in doing that for politicians. To give politicians the game and say, right, you try and fix the city with this amount of resources. <laughs> so, because they're, they're trying to prove a point that there is, there is a limit to what you can do. So the game is only perfect. So when you guys, if you go out and make games, and you think about games, honestly now, the community around your game is as important as the game itself. When you make a game, You've got to understand there's context coming in, the other games people make. If you want to change people, you've got to get them in the right frame of mind when they start playing your game. And then you're going to go into that review phase. You might have during action reviews, where as you play the game, this is what my father did, He's a, my father's a psychologist, um, and what he would do is when, when a kid came in who was you know, depressed or uh, upset, he would say, oh, I'm, I'm busy, I've got, to, I've got the computers over there, you can go and play that game, right? And he wasn't busy, he was just playing it. Um, and so the kid would go and start playing Warcraft 2. My dad really liked Warcraft 2, so he had Warcraft 2 sitting on the computer there. And he got the kid to go and start playing that. And then after a few minutes, he would get up and he'd come and stand beside him and go, oh yeah, I got stuck at that point. And oh, if, if you just click on that unit, you can, like, you can attack them. So he'd help the kid in the game. And once he was on the side of the kid and working with the kid to solve problems in the game, he would then start kind of discussing the rest of life and the other problems the kids were having. So this is so the game can be used as kind of an opening for the police to say, oh, right, so so what aren't we showing in this game that you're struggling with? Because right? now it's about the game and not just a direct confrontation of the police asking you, tell me what's wrong. Right? So it's a building that trust. So we do during action reviews, and we're going to need a teacher as experts, and in-game replays, fan sites, walkthroughs. In normal games, you get all of this activity. Right? This is at least 50% of the value of your game is in the community around the game, rather than just the game itself. We, as game designers, get really focused on the on the the, the actual artifact, the thing we make. And for us, games are amazing artifacts are amazing. For most people, that's just part of the overall experience. So you can't really understand the game and the use of it in society unless you understand all of the context around it. So that was my lecture. Uh, I actually have like about 50 more slides I could talk about, but I have 45 minutes and so I've got 44 of those 45 if I've timed myself correctly. Um, and so now I'm open to questions and thank you for coming and listening to me. So, questions from the audience. We have one. Hi. Hi. Um, so, um, 
Earlier you were talking about the bad rap that gamification has. I'm also a gamification designer, so I deal with that problem. <laughs> I, I feel your pain. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> um, so when you're with a client and you're either in a situation that either the client knows little about the gamification but he knows maybe it's reputation only, or with the client that does know exactly what is gamification but he only knows traditional gamification, you know, the leaderboards. The, 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 the point yeah. stations that you put, yeah, yeah. Well, the leaderboards and the And um, how do you go, what is your process to kind of uh, deconstruct that? Okay, so it basically what, what I do is, is um, try and work out some of the jargon used in that industry, right? So before I, before I meet with someone, I kind of do a quick look up of what terms they use and when they talk about how to motivate people. Um, so, I would, so I try and use their, some of their language. And I try and go down the self-determination route, right? I, I go the right. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve motivation. And so to do that, we have to understand what motivates humans, because it's psychology. And that most of what we do is not about the mechanics of the game, it's about understanding human beings. So the first job is to understand your customers, or your clients, or your constituency, or whoever, whoever, however they use the term to define the people they're trying to affect. We say, right, the first job is for us to help in understanding what your clients are doing and what you need to change, right? Um, and so, I, and, I, and I basically go down the, yes, I know we could just add points and badges and do leaderboards and stuff, but that's quite shallow. You'll get some pickup, um, but it won't be in, it won't become permanent, it won't be a cultural shift, it'll just be uh, like cattle prod, and it will move people for a while until they get used to it. And so, I, so I kind of, I kind of explicitly go down that route. Um, like, did what I say resonate? You kind of agree with some of that, or what? Yeah, you disagree? Just the pitch of what I did. Okay, so, yeah, I, I, so I'm kind of, I was in the ballpark. Okay, so that's what I was commenting with my, <laughs> my colleague. Right. So I'm, I'm kind of boring for you. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> not at all. It's, uh, it's good to, to hear someone say uh, <laughs> what we <laughs> are. What you want to, to know is the truth. <laughs> right, <laughs> you're doing it, it's kind of, hopefully we're doing it right. You hear me say, oh, we're doing this. <laughs> maybe, we have, maybe we're onto something here, yeah. So no, I, I, yeah. basically, I mean, humans are humans, right? So a lot of what we do is the same, regardless of whether you're in Portugal or Norway or New Zealand or anywhere. A lot of our motivations are actually quite similar, and a bunch of those levels of confidence yeah. are similar. <coughs> okay, so that's what I do. Any other? Yep, got one of the uh, You were talking about one city needing yep. help here in the yes. Portuguese police. Yes. Can you explain more what kind of help that it actually needs? So, um, we're at the moment we're using uh, Norwegian developers, and um, Marish and I are currently developing, and so I currently have Unity on this machine, which is why I have like a big heavy machine rather than a lightweight machine with me, and this is annoying to carry around. Um, but you know you can't do Unity on a, a, a small mobile. Okay. You can, but yours is more <laughs> reasonably powerful. It's still annoying, right? Um, so, so at the moment it's in Unity three D. is the front end of it, um, and uh, we're using the we built from the city building kit. We got rid of most of it because it's had code. Um, but what we're doing is we're getting it to the point where we've got all the assets and we've got the city and we've got the city building. Um, what they mainly need help with is probably two things. One is, once we come off the project full time, there will be some maintenance required. Uh, and so we're looking for some students to potentially get engaged in that. And I'd like to have it turn into a startup so the police would pay for continued development. Um, but also some help for the police on building scenarios. Right? Because you guys are game designers, you understand scenarios. They're police and they think they understand scenarios, but I don't think they really do. And I can't keep coming here to Portugal and fixing their bad scenarios. So I'd much rather have someone who was local who they could say, um, hey, could, could you come in and help us with this? And they actually knew some game designers. And I'm, I'm uh, initially having students means that they can 
you can't put students on mission critical back end stuff like their actual reporting app that they want to create. Um, we don't want that to be done by students because you know filing police reports is, could get you in trouble if you do it wrong. So and if you know you drop every second report, that would be a bad thing. Um, but the game is for kids; it's just an engagement thing. So we think student projects would be quite a nice way as we we're trying to make it so that you guys could be involved in extending the game right and adding things to it it's in unity we've tried to code it in reasonable ways there's a bit of sand underneath there so it's a little bit unstable but we're trying to get, we're trying to improve that so it's a reasonable code base in unity um, and so we thought that having some local developers, having some students interested in unity, interested in a real world problem, interested in helping out potentially one of the big challenges in Europe at the moment, northern and eastern Europe, is that you've got a bunch of refugees coming from countries where, in western Europe, when something bad happens and you see police, in, well, certainly in Scandinavia, and I think, well, depends on which part of Portugal you're in, maybe, but you run towards the police because they're going to help you because that's bad. Whereas there's a bunch of countries where people are coming from, where a bad thing happens and you see police and you run that way. Right? Because the police are enforcement and they're gonna blame you for anything that goes wrong. Right? So you feed the, flee the police. Now, trying to get those children to understand that in Portugal and in the UK and in Scandinavia and in Germany, the police aren't there just to punish you. They're actually proximity police. They want to help. They want to make society safer. And so you shouldn't just kind of flee them every time you see them, um, and that kind of change. It also requires that we go into the police, and we work on the police and say, you have to make sure that you are there to help us out, find the real problems early and work with people, right? So it's that kind of mix. So we'd like you guys to be involved, and uh, we've started to have a chat with Manuel about potentially running projects, um, and we discussed having you guys come to Norway in one in semesters as an option for some of your, your education uh, and we'll hopefully send some of our students down here and kind of look at how we can build projects and this is one of those sort of social good projects that we'd like you to be involved with. So if you're interested in Unity, you're interested in working with a real problem uh, and potentially having that go out and be used by the police all through Portugal, we also want to run it through about six other countries so we're going to need Sort of yeah, it to grow and potentially, if we get it right, we can get funding for that expansion. Uh, when you were talking about like motivating people in rewards, uh, what would be the right way to motivate the parents to pick up their kids at the daycare? What would be the right way to motivate children, to, uh, the parents, to pick up their children and limit it? Well, certainly, if you fit them a fine, that's that's probably not going to work, right? As they found out. Um, so in Norway, what they do is they've gone down the government legislation route, which you have three strikes in Norway, right? So if you pick up your kid late three times, right? On the third time, social services come in and we'll start home visits with you, right? So they'll come and see what's going on, right? So they actually send in child services. And if you keep neglecting your children, they will take your children off you and give them to another family. <laughs> right? And they, they do this in Norway, right? So they've got the heavy stick route, right? And you do it or else we'll take your kids from you. Right? Um, and that causes problems, right? Because um, foreigners come to Norway, and then, you know, they ignore the letters because they're in Norwegian, they don't know what they mean. And then child services turn up because they've not been coming to meetings and they've not been trying to resolve the problem. And so child services come in and take the children. Right? And the foreigners go, what? They stole our children. And Norwegian's like, yes, you were neglecting them. <laughs> we will look after them until you can approve as parents. Right? So that's the way to approach. Um, pretty harsh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it takes a few years to get them back, but yeah, mm, it's really brutal. So that's one way, in Norway, every kid is picked up on time. <laughs> so, so one way to motivate them is to threaten to steal the children, right? Um, it's not necessarily the best way, but it's effective. Um, I, if you were going to be doing it, um, one way would be to reward parents who come up on time. 
right? And so you say, okay, here is the, um, this is your standard fee for the kindergarten. But if you pick your kids up 10 minutes early every day, we'll give you a 10% discount. Right? Which means, you know, yeah, there'll be a bunch of parents who will just come and pick up their kids up at normal times. And there may be some that pick up late. But you will get some who will go, oh, I want to get there early and I'll get that discount. So, it, so instead of looking at it as a thing you punish them, you look at you're trying to reward good behavior. It's the World of Warcraft thing. It's, it's the world, yeah, it's the World of Warcraft. So that would be one way that you, yeah, when, they, when they had the punishment, yeah. it was terrible. So they said, oh, no, no, we'll just give you a world world of Warcraft. bonus experience. World of Warcraft initially had a thing where, I remember how the mechanic works, but if you stay in the game for a long amount of time, the, um, <clears throat> your the reward experience. Yeah. Uh, but punished. initially it wasn't like that. You were punished. And when they did game testing, it was horrible, people hate yeah. it. So what they did was they kept exactly the same mechanics, or the same thing, but, but they just changed the language, mm -hmm. saying that, no, no, this is actually a bonus, and when you're not doing it, you're on normal. Yeah. So it's the same thing, so it's <laughs> actually giving the same explanation. You're punishing them, but you're saying it's a little more. Yeah. You just change the language. You change the language, and it changes crazily people are affected by the language very very strongly and so if you change it to a bonus um we had uh, friends in, in new zealand who are, who are developing games um and they were having problems that people were complaining the game was too hard and when they looked at their analytics they were seeing that people were jumping straight into level one and not doing the tutorial levels and when they looked at where they were dropping out of the level they were dropping out because they kept failing to do something that was explained in the tutorial so they just changed all the game and called the tutorial level one. Yep. And all the complaints went away. <laughs> because, you know, I don't need a tutorial, but I'll play level one. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, sometimes you just have to change the way you frame what you're doing. Um, so I mean, yeah, but it, it, it's the same, it's that kind of thing. So um, and there, are, there, are, there are other ways, I mean, you'd have to look at, at kind of what, are the what are motivators in that community, um, particularly around social norms, right? And so if you can kind of create a culture where picking up at your kindergarten, all the parents come together, maybe what you do is you offer coffee, right? So for ten, in the last 10 minutes of picking up kids, there's free coffee and biscuits for parents who turn up, right? And so you get the coffee and biscuits, but you know, there are no coffee and biscuits, they take it away three minutes before the end of the session, right? So if you want your coffee and biscuits, you turn up just like, oh, you have a chat with the other parents, and you create this social agreement that you turn up at that time, say hi, and then you have kids. So, so if you can do those sort of things, where, where you create a, a norm in the group to be, do the right thing. Uh, and would it be that the fine, like if I pay the fine, I'm like, oh, I already paid for this bad behavior, so like I'm excused out of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's basically you, um, at, I, I met an incredibly annoying businessman in New Zealand um, when I was, yeah, okay. you're right, it's almost an oxymoron, they're all annoying businessmen, but, um, but no, so, so it's almost, yes, it's uh, um, yeah, similarism, but, um, and what he did is he paid, um, uh, I think it was $200 a year to Greenpeace, right? and the reason he paid $200 a year to Greenpeace is then he didn't have to care about the environment because he paid someone to care for him. So yeah, there are people who, when they pay the fine, completely expunges their ethics. They're, they know, I've paid, so you know, I'm good. Um, you know, I, I, I met my requirements. I paid Greenpeace to care about the environment for me, and I paid Peter to care about animals for me, so you know, if I kill a cat, no, no, I paid Peter, they can care about that. Um, so yeah, it, it, <laughs> yeah, so it, it's that. There are some people who, if, if they, if you make the system around your environment, around a set of rules that they're willing to understand the consequences of and then break, and say, well, you know, I knew what the costs were, so I made it in judgment and I broke the rules. Uh, I think the classic example of that for me was, and it's been, been a while, but the World Cup game where I think it was Slovenia or someone, um, ball coming in, into the game, and he sits there and he goes, right, Bang, and he handballs and gets red carded, and there's a penalty shot. And the guy misses the penalty shot, his team gets into the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. right? Now, I looked online, and there was about a 50 50 split in the world on whether that's the right thing to do. Should you, as a defender, intentionally break the rules and commit a handball 
if it benefits your team. And about half the world's population seems to say, well, yes, because he knew it would be a red card and he knew there'd be a penalty shot. But so he paid the consequences, he made a good decision, he did the right action for his team because his team had rest. Right? So there's a bunch of people who say that. Another bunch of people say, no, that's cheating. He broke the rules. Breaking the rules is cheating. That's it. The, 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 even if he knew the consequences, it's still breaking the rules. You shouldn't do that. And so it's kind of a bit of an even split um, in how people were responding to that situation. Um, different cultures respond differently. Different sports respond differently. So basketball, for example, the fouling on players, you'll see near the end of the game, they just like hug each other to foul because everybody agrees that, oh, you're fouling, you go for three throws, it's all kind of just part of the game. Right? So there, that rule, that meta rule about cheating has basically become part of the game rules. And, and that's the problem. If you make your fine, kind of just an analytical system that someone can then go, oh yeah, I see what that is, I see the consequences, I'm willing to pay the consequences, and then analytically does the action then you're not using their moral, or social, or ethical decisions. You're asking them to make a kind of financial, logical assessment. Okay, other questions? I do warn my students that I am willing to answer any question um, about anything at all, um, except, and when I said that, my, my, my wife, who's actually my third wife, um, said, um, no, Simon, <laughs> you're not allowed to answer any question. Only questions that don't involve my sexual relations with my wife. So that's off the table, because <laughs> that's about her. But everything else, I'm willing to answer. So. Well, I come from a cognitive neuroscience background. Ah, excellent. And I was curious about one of the examples of these sparks gave to yes. with depression. And uh, so what I'm curious about is, uh, so first of all, how would it work? So how would it uh, potentially even replace mm -hmm. uh, treatment or even work like be a sensible alternative in lack of treatment? Mm -hmm. And I'm also curious whether there are similar projects but uh, as diagnostic tools. So could you use a game to tell if somebody has maybe some chance of having some weak form of depression or could maybe seek professional help? So yes, there are there are um, there is work being done on, on diagnostics. Um, but in terms of this game um, basically, you are, it's an avatar-based game, you create an avatar, and then you're experiencing this, this world of Maori mythology, right? So in New Zealand, we have the, the native Maori culture, and so you are a magic user and you're going through this world. Um, but they've set it up to try and create some of the similar challenges that um, teenagers <coughs> with depression often have. So feelings of isolation, and so you team up to beat off the darkness, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of looking at depression as being a, a darkness and a weight, and you're helping these characters beat that back, right? So it's kind of a, a, a game designed to get people to think about how they might defeat sort of the, the weight and the darkness of depression, right? So it, it was a game around that. And they did work with psychologists to try and sort of look at what feelings were common and how you might kind of counteract those. Um, and um, the effect, basically even the fact that you're putting kids in social groups and, and they're trying to solve problems together made a lot of difference. In fact, just caring about them made difference, right? So, so we don't know how much it was this game versus how much it was society seemed to care about me and they tried to help and gave me something to do. That may have been most of the change, but you know, at least some intervention is better than waiting us. Uh, Everything is better than waiting lists for depression. Um, for diagnostic tools, so one of the things we worked on was uh, mild cognitive impairment in elderly, so the dementia, and we were looking at um, block-based games with augmented reality to try and use it, and we compared it against the mocker test and the MNDC and looked at those as diagnostic tools for early stage dementia and cognitive impairment, so playing games to detect that. Um, there are some reasonably good detection systems for depression, right? So you can actually, basically they just use questions, but you can look at how people respond in games to situations and you can fairly reliably pick up those who have depressive tendencies because they do start responding very differently, right? So um, some of the things like the 
in some of the questions, you, you can't remember specific happy events, but you can remember specific bad events, right? So there is work being done there. I'm not doing any of that at the moment, so, uh, but I, I do know there are some British games who are, who are working on diagnostics for depression. Diagnostics is a tricky area to get into because you hit, in the US, you hit FDA regulations, right? As soon as you go anything other than well-being in games, you know, this is the weight or this is for fitness, you go, this is diagnostic, they go, right, that'll be a $5 million um, <laughs> you know, trial thing, won't it, right? Because you'll have to do a proper three-stage clinical trial um, and that's about five to ten million dollars to run that proper stage clinical trials for a diagnostic tool. And most games don't have ten million dollars to spend on clinical trials. So they, in the US, if you if you use the word diagnostic, then you're either banned or you have to spend <coughs> massive amount of money. So yeah, it's a tricky area. I see, but still the idea would be to insert the questions inside the game. Yep. So while playing yep. the game, it would ask you some question that would be kind of similar to the questionnaires that... Uh... Yeah, um, and, and you create situations where your choices indicate your answer, right? So you try and create, instead of, instead of just popping up a question and asking blah, 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 yes, no, you get them to choose something, right? That is related to that, right? So, so the in-game situation is related to the question, right? So, um, so we were looking at the vlog game, right? One, like, if you ask people to reconstruct the flag, you can also look at how they, how accurately they place the blocks, do and and how that changes over time. So you you are measuring a side effect, right? Not the primary thing they're trying to do to see if their dexterity is changing or their speed is changing. But you don't reward them for speed or dexterity because if you reward them, you lose the value of the measurement. <laughs> so yeah, so oh, I'm, apparently I'm bleeding. <laughs> That's odd. You want so. Um, hopefully I'm not going to bleed too much. <laughs> so, yeah, but no, so it's a, yeah, you, you, diagnostics you have to be a wee bit careful. Yeah. It's just a note, I don't know, but other questions? No, apparently I've exhausted the audience. Well, I have one. <laughs> okay. Hearing you, I, I could not help but uh, uh, remember behavioural economics mm -hmm. it, it is very similar there is a yeah I mean, and, and like understanding economics from a behaviorist point of view like the human behaviors and how you affect them by the economic models that, that you have to work with it but, but I mean that branch of economics that uh, led to the book nudge do you know mm -hmm. yeah that how you can small things here exactly. can have large effects later exactly. on exactly Excellent. Uh, so yeah, I, the thing is, you you can't just okay. I need a little bit of blood. But, um, <coughs> studying widely, studying economics, studying psychology, um, sorry, <laughs> um, studying a um, a bunch of kind of different fields and looking for where people are trying to do things like how do you affect <coughs> economic behaviour as a behavioural change understanding. And games can do the same kind of thing, right? So the game. The gaming interventions, the gaming vacation of things. Often you are trying to do that nudge. You don't want to get kind of be right up in front of people's faces and smash them with it. You want to just give them kind of nudges in the right direction. And for a lot of gamification, for a lot of serious games, um, I I prefer games which benefit the player. So that's why we prefer to look at games for education and games for health and sort of games for social good rather than games as propaganda or games as work. <coughs> because you can motivate people to do things that the company wants them to do, but they don't benefit the individual. Um, and so some of the nudge economics is organizations that aren't looking to benefit the individual they're nudging. They're trying to benefit a corporation that's earning money from that, right? And so for us, as academics, it's kind of nicer to do health and education because the people who benefit from the change are the players. And so you can feel that, you know, I'm making games that the players will benefit from actually being nudged in this direction. Whereas if you start going down some of the economic routes, um, some of the things you're nudged to do um, isn't really the best for you. Um, and I, I, there's a bunch of A-B testing and, and craziness that goes out there 
um, for some of the economic models which are very exploitative. Um, my, my favorite example um, for, well, I've got two good examples, but one that I find interesting is, is if you look at casinos in the US, right, so the, you've got the, the one-armed bandits, the, the slot machines, right? Um, those are actually basically an organism because they've got a genetic algorithm running on them. They look at each individual machine has a set of parameters on how often it pays out uh, and how much it pays out around kind of winning and, and like you know, how big the prize is and how often it pays out. Um, and what happens is at the end of each night, a the, the more successful machine will propagate its values to its neighbors. Right, so it has an evolutionary architecture that propagates the parameters around. And within the casino, it creates an, a, a, a distribution because machines in the front of the room are different to machines in the middle of the room are different to machines in the back of the room. And they're all constantly evolving to extract as much money from people as possible. So it's an evolving organism that is trying to extract money and that's its only goal, right? Um, I mean, that's, that's a really evil application of AI. But you know, it's what casinos do, right? It's what, because their job is to get money out of you. Right? That's, that's what their shareholders want. So, so yeah, I know you can use any of these tools for, to help people increase depression, those who think, or to extract money from them, or to drive them crazy, or to extort money from them. Um, there are, um, and I don't know if I've got time, because we're running out of time, but, um, one of the other examples they use for evil games, because you know, most games I don't consider evil, right? Most games, you know, Grand Theft Auto, it's kind of on the packaging, you see what it is, it's not lying to you, Call of Duty, you're gonna shoot people, you know, it's up front. Um, one of the games I thought was, was particularly evil was a game called Pony Stars. <laughs> Doesn't sound evil, um, and it, it, it's gone now, but it was, it was a Swedish game. And they had about 100,000 um, Swedish te tweens, right? So between sort of 8 to 14. Um, and it was a game where, online game, on the internet, and you've got ponies, and you'd look after your ponies. Right? And they're working out, what's the monetization strategy that makes the most money from a pony game? Right? And so what they did is they did A-B testing, where they put people into groups, and they try different monetary strategies, right? So what you do is you put one group in and you say, right, we'll run a subscription model, right? Monthly subscription, we'll see how much money that makes. We'll do a micro-purchase model, right? Where you have to buy things for your ponies. We'll have a model where you get one pony and you have to lavish all your attention on one pony. And then if you want another pony, you have to buy ponies rather than buying items. So you just buy ponies and that's how they make money. Um, and so they looked at, at these, these different business models. And the one that, that made the most amount of money was not a subscription, you got everything for free, everything was lovely, but you had to manually brush and feed your pony every day, and every one of your ponies. So you could start with one pony, and it would take two or three, two minutes to, one and a half, two minutes to, to feed the pony and then brush down the pony every night, right? And so that's, you know, that was just the chore, right? So friction is, yeah, from a design point of view. And then what people do is you pay to remove friction. So they had an angel service, right, that you could pay for that would brush and feed your pony every night if you didn't have time. Um, and for one pony, eh, you're not going to pay someone to do that for you. But once you get like 20 ponies, and it's taking you like half an hour, 45 minutes every night, to brush and feed every one of your ponies. That the subscription to pay the angel to do it for you starts to become attractive. Um, and then you go on holiday and your mum won't let you use her 4G for half an hour every night on holiday. But you can check your email and you get an email from your ponies and they're looking sad and they're looking <laughs> hungry and you need to pay the angel. Please. <laughs> and, and so the best way of making money from a 10 year old girl is to get a, to fall in love with a pony and then threaten to kill it. And she will find you money. Right? Um, which, that's evil, right? 
that for me, getting children to fall in love with something and threatening to kill it, that, that's game gone wrong, right? That's not what, I don't want any of you making games like that. Yes, you will make money, but you will not sleep well. <laughs> but yeah, so, so that, and you know, they, they never got to the point where they were actually killing ponies, right? It was just, you know. But there is no laws against this, right? Because the ponies were on the company's servers. The, the, um, the, the girls never paid anything for those ponies. Right? There was no property exchange, there was no ownership exchange, right? This was just bits on the server. So if they turned the bits off, there was no harm done. So as far as the law is concerned, they can extort as much money as they like from those kids. Right? Now that, that's evil, right? And we need to, that's, that's where I think they get it wrong, is extorting money from small girls. Um, okay, but I think, I think it's probably time to yeah. yeah. So where you go? Let's thank Simon. So, and if you're interested in working with the city cop thing, we'll be in contact with you as well or directly. Be great. <laughs>